Hello everyone, thanks a lot for coming to my talk. Uh, let's talk about JavaScript. I have the feeling it's an important topic in this conference this year. Um, so, who am I? I'm Vladimir de Turkem. I work in an ASM company, Application Security Management. We basically do runtime protection for diverse applications, but I work specially on Node.js. And I'm one of the founding members of the Node.js Security Working Group at the level of the uh, Node.js slash OpenJS Foundation, and I am a Node.js collaborator. Meaning that this talk will be mostly about what's the current state of security on Node.js from the point of view of the Node.js Foundation and the Security Working Group. Obviously, uh, it will be my take on that, because uh, some other members of the working group are in the room. I won't point finger on them right now. So, um, just to make sure everyone is uh, at the same page on Node.js, I will do a short intro on that. And I promise the rest of the talk will be much more interesting than this first boring part. So, Node.js, it's a JavaScript runtime. Basically, it enables you to run JavaScript server-side, not in a browser or directly on a, on a, on a server-side or a desktop. It's mono-threaded, it's single-threaded, and that's actually pretty important for the rest of the talk, meaning that when you run some piece of JavaScript code, nothing else is running. There is no other piece of JavaScript code running concurrently or parallelly to your code execution. Because we still want Node.js to be performant and being able to do diverse things at the same time, Node.js is fully asynchronous, meaning that uh, access to database or network access or anything actually that is not directly written in JavaScript happens somewhere else asynchronously. Meaning I want to do a query in my database, I don't have to stop my thread until the result of the database query is available. I can just, you know, do something else and come back to that query later. And that's basically the main paradigm of Node.js. Everything is asynchronous. Accessing the file system is asynchronous. You don't need to block what you are doing when you want the content of a file. You can do something else at the same time. Also, worth noticing, Node.js has the widest and biggest ecosystem in the world. Meaning that NPMs, um, the company hosting the Node.js dependencies is basically the biggest repository in the world. And you can take this, uh, this picture every other month, every other year, it will always have the same shape. Node.js ecosystem and JavaScript ecosystem in general, because that's also JavaScript, is much more, um, much more popular than any other ecosystem combined, and it's not growing slowly. We will reach the million of package hosted on NPM this year. So what is Node.js good for? Obviously web servers, but because it's JavaScript and people love to hack around with JavaScript, they put JavaScript everywhere. So you can use Node.js for IoT, for scripting, and one of the most important use of Node.js right now with web servers is front-end tooling. Meaning like if you want to build a front-end website, or even if you're using WordPress, you're likely to have Node.js running on your computer for bundling or getting dependencies for the front-end part of your application. Node.js is everywhere and it cannot be avoided. I would be quoting the CTO of the NPM company when I asked who are your clients, he answered basically every company in the world is my client. Every company in the world uses the NPM ecosystem. So I, I like to think it's a big deal. And the question is, okay, Node.js is a 10 years old technology, and I lied, there is a second boring part in my talk, sorry. Uh, Node.js is a 10 years old technology based on a language that has not really been widely popular in the computing, in the serious computing science world for decades. Uh, and no, we can't carry on like that. We have to take measures because big company, big enterprise are using Node.js in production, and how can we make it safer for everyone? It's not a toy language to make moving menus in a web page anymore. 
introducing the OpenJS Foundation. That's brand new, so I can't tell a lot about that yet because I don't fully understand the functionment of this new foundation. Basically, it used to be a Node.js foundation for a few years that was handling Node.js and a JS a foundation handling a few open source projects. Both of these foundations have merged two months ago, and the first summit of the OpenJS Foundation is happening right now in Berlin, so I have huge FOMO of that because of that. But I'm happy to be in Tel Aviv still. Um, so you really want to take a look at that because it's a, basically a sub-foundation of the Linux Foundation that's in charge of managing the JavaScript ecosystem at large and Node.js in particular. So in the Node.js part, there is a technical steering committee. Basically, those are the people who own the GitHub repository of Node.js, and they do whatever they want with it. Um, they have chartered a security working group that is made of diverse other members of the Node.js organization that have in charge of diverse topics, including writing policies and managing process for Node.js core and Node ecosystem. Uh, vulnerability database management, we'll come back to that later, and evangelism and assistance. So I'm currently doing the evangelism part. Feel free to ping me if you want help with the assistance part. Um, so, valuable question, how do we handle security for Node.js core itself? We've got a bug booty program that HackerOne's provides us for free, and HackerOne people are awesome helping us here. And we distribute reward thanks to a, a consortium named the IBB, Internet Bug Bounty, that's basically big player of the internet that fund bug bounty programs for some critical projects such as Ruby, Python, and Node.js. So if you find a real vulnerability in Node.js, please don't report issues in the test of a dependency that happened, and I'm not giving you a bounty for that. If you have a real dependency vulnerability in Node.js, feel free to uh, report it on HackerOne, and we will be more than happy to give you a few thousand dollars if it is that really valuable, and you will get the fame of finding vulnerabilities in Node.js. Um, also, we've got a private fork. I'm not sure this will remain with the new GitHub feature, but basically to give you an overview of what happens when someone reports a vulnerability in Node.js, the vulnerability is reported, we decide if that's a vulnerability of, or not, that's a triage phase, and then if we are able to reproduce this and consider it as a vulnerability, we fix that on a private fork where only a few members of the Node core team have access to. Then we blog and tweet that there will be a security release that day at that time, and we embargo the CI that is public, and we publish the patch. So you want to follow Node.js or myself on Twitter because you will get the information of a new version of Node.js with security fixes being published. I swear it's the last few boring slides. We will get to the hacking part in a few seconds. For the ecosystem one, we also have a bug bounty program. We don't really distribute bounty yet, but a few big players of the internet, including Coinbase, have started to fund us and decide that we could give bug bounty. We are still figuring out what will be the criteria for giving that. And we hold a public repo of ill vulnerabilities found in the ecosystem. Meaning that if you find a vulnerability in something that's hosted on NPM, you can report that to us, and we will get in touch with the maintainer, have it fixed, give you the fame, and potentially even give you money for that. And we've got a public vulnerability database available on a GitHub repo named Security Advisories, so feel free to use that and build tools around it. It's really fun to use. And that's it for the boring process management part. Let's go to hacking, because hacking is fun. Um, first question, what are the security issues in Node.js? And I'm pretty sure nobody will be surprised. I will start with the OWASP top 10 first item, injections. Oh, no, okay. Terrible transition, there will be code, sorry. There will be code showing injections. So we'll start with the SQL injection because it's basically the, uh, the kid's story in the security world. Everyone wants to learn how to do them, everyone wants to see them, everyone wants to learn about them. So let's just, I am sure everyone knows in, about them in this room, but that will help me introduce the syntax of Node.js and the framework named Express. 
So on this piece of code, we just have an endpoint, a controller defined with the most popular Node.js framework named Express. So we call a get method, meaning we will define a get endpoint. And then we put the URL, slash post, slash colon ID, meaning that ID will be a dynamic parameter. And when some, someone does a request on that endpoint, what happens, the function we passed as parameter is called with two arguments, one being rec, request, and the other one being response. I know I should write rec and response, but the slide will be too small for that. On line two, we are building a SQL query by appending the ID we take from the request, so uh, the framework put it on params, so that's basically express documentation, but it tells us the ID in the URL will be available on the request object under the params object in the ID key. And then we throw that into the database, and as you can see, we don't wait synchronously for the result of the database. We don't do x equals database.query. We do database.run, and then we pass a callback function. And this callback function will be called by the asynchronous manager, libuv, when the results are available. And then we JSON send the result to the user. So, no surprise if the ID of my request is just the integer one, my SQL query becomes select star from items where ID equals one, and the outcome would be the document which has an ID equals one, and I hope it's a primary field in your database and you don't have multiple documents with the same ID. And as we are all security aware people, we can check that there is a terrible SQL injection in this piece of code because we are appending string. So if a malicious attacker use one or true as, a, as an ID, as a value for ID, the SQL query becomes obviously select star from items where ID equals one or true. And we get all the item in the database. It's Yahoo style bad and you should avoid that. So, uh, Usually, usual uh, mitigation solution at work, like use prepared statements. They exist in the drivers, they exist in the database. It's not because it's JavaScript that everything we learned from PHP and Java has disappeared. And let's go to something a bit more naughty, even if yesterday I saw a great demo of that in PHP. We'll move to object injection, because JavaScript is an untyped language. So unlike Java, when you deserialize data, it won't crash when you deserialize data to a class that does not respect the same shape. Basically, you could tell a web application, hey, here is a value uh, and you're expecting a certain type, but nothing prevents me from giving you another kind of value at this position. So here we'll use a post endpoint, post slash document slash find. And we create an object named query, and if the body of the incoming HTTP request has a field named title, we put that in the query, and if the body of the HTTP request has a field named desired title, we put that in the query too, and we send that to MongoDB through uh, the Mongo driver. And if we re-execute that locally, if we have reg.body being desired type string blog, and I emphasize this on the string blog, the SQL, the, doc, poof, the MongoDB query becomes document.find type string blog, right? And the outcome of this query will be all the documents in the collection named documents that have a field named blog, that is a string, uh, that has a field named type, that, uh, that has a string value named blog. And since it's MongoDB, you could have whatever you want. You know, there is no, uh, there is nothing uh, enforcing any schemas on your data, so any query in Mongo can give unexpected results. But in us restoring MongoDB, let's inject something. So there's nothing in that piece of code that prevents someone from crafting an HTTP request with a curl command, a postman, or even uh, hacking into your front-end application to send another kind of body payload. And in that case, the field desired type is not the string blog anymore, it's the sub-object dollar in E, dollar not equal to, Zero. That's an instruction for MongoDB. And at the end of the day, the SQL, the document, whoa, the MongoDB query becomes document.find type not zero. And you get everything that is in the collection. So that's basically equivalent to what we did previously in SQL by getting everything in a table. And once again, it's Yahoo bad. So. Enough with injections, I want to talk about something that is more dangerous in JavaScript than in some other languages. So remember, JavaScript is single-threaded, meaning that if you run something in JavaScript, that's gonna be the only thing 
running in the JavaScript process at this point. So a long synchronous operation does what we call blocking the event loop, meaning that your web server, your process won't be able to do it won't be able to do anything else than handling this piece of synchronous code, right? So if you manage to find a very slow regex, and that can happen by accident, that happen by accident when you write your own regex, you you can get your app being unresponsive because it will be just working on the regex for an infinite time. So let's go with an example. I never do live demo because I have bad luck usually. But let's go with an example. At this point, we just have on line one a regex that is defined, and on line two, a string named S with an exclamation mark. And we will just append A's at the beginning of that string and pass that in the regex and monitor the time it takes. So let's say we have the string only exclamation mark. The time to execute the regex on that string is fairly small. It's a quarter of a millisecond. And there is a warm up thing. So, okay, good enough. When we've got five A's and one exclamation mark, we still are be way below the millisecond. So it's still really good. But things get funnier when you get to 15 A's and one exclamation mark, you are up to one millisecond. And if you append five more A's, you go directly to up to 30 milliseconds. And if you go to 30 A's, you've got to 30 seconds. So I tried to plot that on a graph, and as you can see, it doesn't mean anything because I did not use a logarithmic scale. And basically, the, um, it's so exponential that a string long enough will make your application unresponsive for a while. And it can be used maliciously, but it's also shooting yourself in the foot if you have that in production with uh, not malicious users, you know, it happens. So redos are really problematic and can be basically a source of denial of service in Node.js application or in all single threaded technologies. Okay, and let's go for a funnier thing because the talk is about Node.js and JavaScript ecosystem, right? And I've been talking only about Node.js, so let's talk about the ecosystem. Okay, who here knows a module named Webpack? Okay, so for those who don't use it, who don't know it, it's basically one of the most popular modules in the world. If you do front-end programming, you are probably using Webpack, probably your colleagues are using it. It's a very handy tool to uh, bundle a front-end application, transform the code, uh, inject CSS directly in JS with XML, because why not? And it's one of the most popular package in the JavaScript world. So in the programming world, in the web world at least. And when you npm install Webpack, you don't install Webpack. You install Webpack and it, it's 336 dependencies, meaning that all these people on the left-hand side of this table, of this uh, screen, have execution rights on your machine because you are running their piece of software. And it's all right because, for instance, uh, the fourth guy on this line, it's Isaac, I know him, so I trust him. And here is Cholker, I know him. But I don't know all of these people. So yeah, it's a bit worrying. And that's basically the thing. Uh, abusing that will make attack attackers able to attack not your web production, but the desktop, the workstation of the developers you work with. And that's what's interesting. And that's not only a prediction, because it actually happened last year. Last summer, ESLint has been breached. So do you know ESLint? Who knows ESLint? ESLint is like one of the most popular tools for code quality in JavaScript. And it's one of the most downloaded package on NPM. Once again, these slides have been written uh, in January. But it's downloaded two million times a year, like just two million times a year. And that's a lot. This package is massively popular. And actually, someone were able to compromise the account, the NPM account, of one of the maintainers of ESLint, because this person was reusing a password uh, with other things, and there have been a list of passwords that breached, and they used that on NPM. And the attacker were smart. They did not attack by uh, publishing a wrong version of ESLint, but they published two uh, malicious versions upon which ESLint depends. So two packages that ESLint uses with malicious versions. 
Basically, uh, this script fetched a payload on Pastebin and was aiming at collecting the, NP, the content of the npm rc file that contains the token for accessing npm. Meaning that if that exploit runs on your machine and you have published write, say you are working for a company publishing npm modules and you have published write for one of them, those publishing rights will be stolen. Or if your company is using private registry and you have tokens to fetch these modules, these tokens would have been stolen. So actually it was not that good. And NPM reacted pretty quickly by revoking all access tokens at once. They consider that 4.5K account might have been compromised. And finally, they learned, and now you can uh, force people to use 2FA when publishing a package, not only when to log in to NPM. So obviously, we are learning from our mistakes and making the ecosystem safer. But we are security people. We know that bulletproof does not really exist at the end of the day. Actionable items, because I promised to tell you who to defend against these attacks. So let's go for the uh, saving private Node.js part of the talk. First of all, update Node.js. Like, you would be surprised how many people are still using Node.js 4 in production, and I'm not even mentioning Node.js 6, that is out of support for one month now, meaning that when you come back at work on Sunday or Monday, just check what the version of Node.js are running on your production. If that Node.js 6, you won't get security patches anymore for that version. Time to migrate to Node.js 10 or even better 12 because it will be available soon. Uh, Self-promotion moment, I publish a nightly builds Docker version of Node.js. So you want, if you want uh, to try your, uh, your application against the future version of Node.js, just check my GitHub, there is a, a Docker link where you can get nightly builds. So that goes without saying, but it's still better to remind everyone about it. Review the use of critical core modules. So at the top, at the, uh, at the ooh, on the first line, there is a few of these booklets. We've got a lot of recommendations, one of them being this, this uh, critical module, file system, child process, VM, must not be called with unsanitized user inputs. So if you don't manage to get one of these, just contact me, I get one sent to you or sent you the PDF link. Uh, so make sure you know what gets into your app and what gets into the critical modules that have system access. Sanitize input. So remember the MongoDB injection. Basically, type checking protects against that. So type check with a library that is really cool from the happy community that is named Joy, that is easy to use, and that will help you to say, oh, the shape of data that gets into my app must comply to that string, must comply to that regex. Don't regex those through that. But yeah, check that library. I'm, I know I have been really scary about regex dos, but hopefully there are solutions for that. So Jamie Davis, who is doing a PhD at IBM right now, has a, a tool that detects regex. You give the code base and it detects regex. And I forgot to update this slide because I published a module that basically enables you to time bomb regex. You can say, this regex cannot run for more than two milliseconds. Otherwise, please stop this execution. And that's the only way you can stop synchronous chunk of code in Node.js. So check that and check my GitHub because, hey, I want some pain too. Um, monitor your dependencies for known issues. There are awesome vendors for that who do that uh, commercially for you. Uh, one of them even being in the room, not only in the conference. So go talk to these people because they do a tremendous job to help you being safe. Also, you can build your own tool using the security working group uh, database and I will be more than happy to see what awesome thing you built internally or not. Monitor the dependency tree, like go on this website. So REC and request, there are two modules who do exactly the same thing. There are HTTP clients, they enable you to perform HTTP requests from an ad process. One of them has dozens of dependencies, the other has two that are part of the same organization and have the same maintainer. I know which one is the most stable and the less likely to have malware into the, its dependencies. Thanks so much for your attention. Let's keep in touch. The presentation is online. And I have time for a couple questions if you want. Or maybe you're all sleeping now. Is, uh, is uh, 
Um, that's a good question. Um, it's not really Node.js to say that it's more the people who make JavaScript to decide if, uh, if that will go in that direction. What I can say is that regarding type trusting, a lot of efforts are happening right now. And regarding TypeScript, it's a great technology for code quality, but it's not a great tool for safety. Because basically, it will prevent you from calling a method with types you don't expect, because at compilation, it will check your code. But there is no type checking included at runtime, meaning that when your application will get external inputs, people who can still type temper. So I don't see any uh, initiative actively in the Node community right now. Yeah? How do we get involved in the security working group? That's an excellent question, you total stranger who is not involved in the security working group. Um, basically, if you're based in Tel Aviv, you offer a beer or a coffee to Liran Tal and he will tell you everything. Otherwise, uh, feel free to ping us on Twitter or just to show up on the GitHub repo. We have a lot of open issues that can use a lot of help. So you go to Node.js on GitHub and you find the repo that name Security WG. And there's a lot of open issues, a lot of initiatives. We have monthly meetings and technically they are only open to members of the working group, but we will be more than happy to have you here because we are an open community and we love everyone. So if you have spare time and you want a bit of the Node.js security fame to give talk in conference because that's a great uh, line on your uh, business card, just join us, we will be more than happy to work with you. Yeah? I love your t-shirt. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, by the way, my question is related uh, to this in short. Uh, you have mentioned that uh, nowadays uh, ecosystem of uh, Node.js and NPM is uh, uh, the most uh, biggest one. So NPM has uh, the, mo the most big number of packages in it. At the same time, you have mentioned that, uh, for example, the problem with Webpack, when you simply don't know ever what uh, dependencies do, uh, do this, uh, do some package use and who is written by. Uh, do you plan uh, to make maybe some guidelines for new developers of packages to reduce the number of uh, dependencies? Because you know this uh, funny story with uh, some a little package which was deleted and uh, that was some kind of chaos. So yeah, that, that, that's really true and that happened. Um, so there's an initiative in the security working group upon helping developers making safer packages and better packages. That will be guidelines. Also at the same time, there's a commercial tool uh, helping you uh, finding quality packages. And I know that a couple other actors are coming in that direction. So uh, also another best practice will be to lock your dependencies. Once you found a good set of dependencies, you use what we call a lock file, meaning that when you reinstall your project, you will get the dependencies only in the certain versions that you had when you created the lock file. Also, NPM has a policy against unpublishing packages now. Uh, you can only unpublish a package that has been published in the last 24 hours, otherwise you have to contact NPM directly. And my understanding is that GitHub uh, package hosting is, will be following the same uh, policy at this point. Okay, thank you. My pleasure. Okay, uh, thanks so much for your attention. I'm all around the conference, so if you want to learn about application security management, RASP and Node.js, feel free to let me know. <laughs>